Welcome to Field Lab Earth, the podcast that's all about past and present advances in the fields of agronomic, crop, soil, and environmental sciences. Today, we'll be talking to Dr. Andreas Varhola about using memes and humor in the classroom. When the COVID-19 pandemic hit, teachers had to rapidly adapt to new, fully online teaching environments. For Andreas, who had a naturally humorous teaching style, he needed to not only find a way to teach his students well, but to do so in a way that still reflected his personal teaching philosophy. In this episode, Andreas discusses how the use of laugh tracks, memes, and a pleasant, lighthearted tone helped him and his students to thrive. We'll talk more about that in a minute, but before we dive in, we want to thank our sponsor, Meter Group. Meter specializes in robust soil moisture sensing, innovative weather monitoring, cloud data logging, advanced data visualization software, and more. Their well-published scientific instrumentation is used worldwide in universities, research and testing labs, government agencies, agriculture, and industrial applications. Listen to their new podcast, We Measure the World, to hear how innovative researchers leverage environmental data to make our world a better and more sustainable place at metergroup.com slash fieldlabearth. I'm your host, Abby Morrison. Let's talk about science. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the show. Today, we have Andreas Varhola with us. Andreas is a forest engineer and PhD, currently teaching as an assistant professor of teaching at the forest faculty of the University of British Columbia, or UBC. He completed his undergraduate program at Universidad Austral de Chile in Valdivia, Chile, then worked for five years in his homeland, Ecuador, as a forest manager, after which he completed his PhD at UBC. He's been teaching there since 2012. Hi, Andreas. Welcome to the show. How are you doing today? I'm good. Thanks so much. I really, really appreciate this opportunity and I'm excited for for what is coming. Wonderful. We are so happy to have you on. I am particularly excited because I remember seeing your submission come into our journal and being like, if that's accepted, I want to interview this person Uh, because today we are going to be talking about the use of humor and memes in teaching classes, specifically online classes. So just as a bit of background, can you tell us a little bit about um, your story and kind of how this entire research project came about? Mm -hmm. So I was always really into adding humor into my classes. So I've been doing that since I started teaching. And I I tend to believe that I have a humorous personality per se. So some people have uh, difficulties taking me seriously. And um, sometimes they cannot distinguish if I'm I'm saying a joke or if I'm really serious. And that is sometimes a problem for me because I I have to really tell people, no, this is serious, please. (laughs) Like, I'm not joking. So that, that happens from time to time time to time and I I get some people with that uh, uh, fairly often actually so so my humorous uh, teaching style was always there and it was only when we shifted online that this became a problem rather than a, than a solution because it was it was so important to me to give some entertaining value to students in my lectures that uh, I remember the moment at which I thought, "Uh oh, this is going to be really difficult for me." And it was uh, actually in one of the first uh, zoomed uh, lectures. So I said, I, I, "I cracked a joke," and I could not see any reaction whatsoever at the moment because it was just people. Not too many people were even even showing cameras and their faces in the screen, so. And it was a fairly good joke, and it was like so <laughs> awkward to have that. Uh, like me, should I laugh myself? Uh, what do I do? So that moment hit me, and I thought, how am I going to do this if the if COVID keeps on going and we need to redesign courses and and that sort of thing? So it was really, really a moment of um, a lot of reflection. And then it didn't take long. I said, well. I'll put laugh tracks in my pre-recorded videos because these live sessions uh, were just to end the term. The pandemic started in March, so it was like a few lectures left and nobody was expecting much from us. Just finish the best we can. Uh, And so I thought moving forward, 
uh, I am going to just to uh, do pre-recorded lectures as the main uh, teaching material for my mostly introductory courses. So that was ideal. And then I thought, yeah, I'll put the laugh tracks, problem solved. So it was like a really, really easy way out. Uh, and um, that would allow me to keep my humorous style and survive in the online environment. I would love if you would talk about maybe some of the different types of humor that mm -hmm. were on the table or not, maybe on the table yep, yep. for this kind of thing. And what other research examples are out there about whether or not this actually helps students mm -hmm. to have funny lectures and teaching courses? Yeah, absolutely. So in terms of the types of humor, uh, humor is a really broad concept and it, it belongs to the wider psychology fields, right? So you can think about how, when was the first time we laughed in the history of human existence, right? Uh, so for, for educational purposes, I think it is appropriate to simplify it a little bit and not think of complex behavioral components. But I think the most useful uh, categories for humor in education is uh, one that includes content-related humor and content-unrelated humor. And so there's a lot of literature about that. Um, and um, I'll tell you my experience with, with both. But uh, before that, there's also a couple of other categories. One is uh, self-disparaging humor humor that is directed kind of towards the instructor. So you make fun of yourself in front of the students uh, versus aggressive humor. The word aggressive is a bit aggressive on its own, uh, but it means teasing the students as well. Um, I, ha I don't do that uh, straight up. I think it's too risky and it, 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 you, it can go wrong really, really quickly. So I don't do that. The self-disparaging, I, I do a lot, actually. Uh, but the, the most important distinction that I was mentioning is between content related and content unrelated. And I think that when you incorporate humor in your lessons, you have to have a good balance between both. Because if you include a lot of content unrelated, if you're just being goofy in the classroom and uh, telling funny jokes and stories that are unrelated, that might uh, help uh, improve the atmosphere in the classroom um, and other other benefits, but I think the most uh, effort should be put into adding really clever content related humor. Um, so in my courses, I have an example. The best example I have, and it's really it's uh, described in detail in the article, is um, we teach hydrology and how different watersheds react differently to precipitation, for example. So imagine a paved watershed will just move all that water really quickly to the outlet versus a, a really complex watershed with trees and and different topography and, and so on. Um, and so instead of calling those uh, a flashy watershed or a, or a, or a unresponsive watershed, more technical terms, I just call them the crazy watershed and the boring watershed. And, and that really helps students because I can ask them three years later, is that watershed boring or crazy? And they know exactly what I'm talking about. So I think uh, that really helps into the long-term memory, which in my view should be the end goal of everything. We want students to remember things forever. <laughs> uh, and so, so yeah, th those are the categories that I, that I think are most useful, the content related and content unrelated. Uh, there's others. You can classify humor in so many different ways. You can also classify it uh, spontaneous versus planned or the type of humor. You can do a funny joke. You can do an impersonation. You can use a, a, a prop uh, and things like that. So, so that is uh, my view and what I think the literature mentions about the types of humor in education that I, that I also summarize in the article. Uh, examples of research, there's a lot. There's a lot out there. Uh, it is really clear that humor has important benefits. Like I, I summarized it in the article as well. Um, I got all the different quotes from studies, and these are some of the things that 
humor does. It increases enjoyment, reduces boredom, enhances attention, facilitates retention, produces a less stressful learning atmosphere, improves student-teacher relationships, promotes creativity, augments the sense of belonging to the class, increases learning speed, elevates motivation, provokes thought, and, and others, right? So these are just a few examples. Um, in terms of the benefits, like how do you quantify that? That is the that is the main question. So there, there are a few articles I can mention. A couple, um, uh, most show a positive effect. Uh, articles sometimes struggle to statistically quantify what portion of the increased performance is due to humor directly, and and that is a very difficult thing to do scientifically speaking. Uh, but there's a couple of articles. So, uh, for example, uh, Luo and Zan, um, 2021, and cited in the article, they correlated uh, teaching um, humor types. So, content related, content unrelating, and also self disparaging and aggressive humor. And, and so, it was interesting because they correlated it to performance and academic interest. Because not everything is also grades, right? Performance is related to grades, essentially, but not, not, not all of it is related to grades. And grades may not even reflect long-term learning. So you can have a relatively bad grade, but you remember a key, com key elements of your, of your courses, right? So, so they showed a, a positive correlation with performance. Um, and content-related humor, as you might have expected. It was statistically significant, but a bit weak. Uh, and I think that also has to do with the way we use correlation to explore this, this cause and effect, and correlation might not be appropriate in many, in many cases. Uh, but interestingly, they also found that self-disparaging and aggressive humor displayed uh, poor negative correlations on academic performance, but aggressive humor did have a positive influence on academic interests. So these are these are things that we find. Uh, another study uh, by Los Cavio, Los Chiavo and Schatz, uh, 2005, uh, they contrasted two sections of a course. It's, it was online, and one course had a lot of humor purposely embedded in it, and another one had none. And so that was an interesting uh, experimental design. They included um, humorous elements uh, as uh, content-related jokes in lectures, pretty much, uh, but also cartoons and quizzes, amusing remarks, and things like that. And uh, the humorous version, they reported, had a clearly better communication atmosphere and showed statistically significant enhanced interest and participation. But they didn't find a discernible effect on student performance. So, so that is interesting. As I mentioned before, sometimes we struggle to make that connection. Uh, however, there are other studies, uh, not necessarily in the online environment. This, the ones I mentioned that are uh, in an online environment, but um, another study by Ziv in 1988, they did find that course averages rose about 10% with the use of humor. So I think that uh, it is it is difficult to say exactly why in some cases we can detect uh, performance improvement or when we can't, but it may have to do with experimental design and it may also have to do with the method that we use to evaluate that. It's a whole different topic, but uh, regression and correlation are not not the best uh, to isolate these effects in ma in many cases. Uh, so those are a few things, but when you read the literature in humor and education, you clearly see that there's a, a in no doubt there's a positive effect. I remember one of the articles I read that tried tried something and using humor. They concluded that in the worst case scenario, it is harmless. So adding humor is harmless. Um, of course, that you have to do it in the in the right way. They, there can be harmless humor <laughs> uh, if you use it too much or if you uh, use uh, the aggressive humor too much, uh, maybe then that's not, not appropriate, right? But the more content-related humor you include that is clever and appears at the right time, the better, I think. Obviously, this was not something that you just did on the fly when you were mid-lecture. So there was a lot of work as far as what techniques you used, um, the technology that you used or learned in order to incorporate this. 
Um, so I would love if you could talk about that as well as just the general process of, you know, how you went about figuring out where to put jokes and what kind of jokes to use. And you even involved your uh, TAs in this. So I would love to hear about their involvement in this process as well. Yeah, absolutely. So in terms of the techniques themselves, um, let's talk Let's talk about the laugh tracks because that was the most, um, requiring the most moving parts, I would say. Uh, and so it wasn't really that hard. I got some laugh tracks. They're, they're freely available online. You can find them. It's not, it's not difficult to download some or pay a little bit for them. And I already had some familiarity with video editing. So the faculty gave us a license to Camtasia. So I used Camtasia as a software. It's really easy to use. Like it's, it, I was really, really happy with that. Uh, and so, Adding the laugh tracks wasn't an enormous challenge in terms of the technical uh, needs. The difficult part about the laugh tracks was doing it professionally because it, it could be awkward. If you place the tr laugh track, it's just microseconds uh, incorrectly, L like the whole thing is screwed up. So the joke doesn't really work. It has to be. So I struggled at the beginning with uh, maybe move it a little bit. A millisecond after I say this word, sometimes there were jokes that were ongoing, so um, they lasted for a minute. And so how do I do that? So I, I sometimes needed to edit the laugh tracks themselves. Um, some laugh tracks came with different um, different parts, so uh, a laugh and then silence and then a laugh. So I had to bring them together, like cut the empty spaces between them. Um, so those were the, the things that, I struggled a little bit at the beginning. It wasn't that that it wasn't difficult. It was just time consuming. So I would spend hours. Okay, let's do this perfectly. I'm I'm a perfectionist, so I, I couldn't have anything slightly off. And so so that was uh, the main the main thing, right? Um, in terms of other uh, humoristic uh, contents. Uh, it wasn't really that difficult, but it it requires a bit of planning, right? So it, it is a bit of work. So, for example, the use of memes. That was where the TAs uh, were more involved. So I told you, you know, find memes of stuff, right? Uh, add memes, send memes here, send memes there. And especially in my statistics course, they did a really good job. We had a we had a a folder where we put all of those in the cloud, and uh, so we could we could grab them and put them in an announcement or at the end of an assignment or things like that. Um, so that, that is again easy with memes. You have to be cautious because uh, believe it or not, uh, they are designed for going viral, but they may be subject to copyright. So you need to really make sure that you're not violating or that you're in fair, fair use of, of things. Um, but another big thing that I incorporated and this happened before was a lighthearted language everywhere in my courses. So the syllabus is written not with jokes per se, but in a way that catches your attention and that is not producing a big laughter, but at least a chuckle or a smile, right? So that can be incorporated everywhere. It can be incorporated in student announcements. It could be incorporated in instructions for different assignments, in um, different pages in your in your learning management system to introduce topics. So every time I try to to include that. Um, so the the writing style is a, is a big one, and uh, another component that has humor, like kind of implicit, is playing games. For example, so I. I play a lot of Kahoot games, so I like I like that app and just the music that they put and the, it, it makes it funny on its own, right? So what I'm getting into is that, and we will talk about that at the end, I assume, but uh, or later, is that uh, how do we incorporate humor when we are not uh, self-perceiving ourselves as a as a funny person, right? So. How do you perceive yourself with your sense? How, how would you rate your sense of humor? 
And so most people tend to be on the serious side, I, I have found, when, when they teach. And so can that be developed? Can that be enhanced? Can that be changed? Or how can you adapt your particular personality to produce a particular type of humor? So I think those are the, those are the questions that, that one would have in mind. Something that I'm interested in is I know that some of them kind of took a bit of like a setup even, mm -hmm. um, like the phone call one, things like that. So what was your process for, you know, planning these things, uh, even like pre-writing your jokes? How, like, what mm -hmm. does it look like for you to, to write a joke? Um, obviously if you, if you've had this, you know, humorous teaching style for a long time, maybe did you have, you know, graphics or assets from yeah, live yeah. lectures that you could incorporate? What did that look like? Yeah, so I would say I didn't count from all the jokes I incorporated in the pre in the pre recorded videos. I can't tell you how many were planned and how many were spontaneous. I would tend to think that is is close to fifty fifty. Uh, and so there were some that were clearly planned, even with the graphics in the PowerPoint itself, like the animation will lead to the joke. Uh, but some others that that occurred to me right there or. There, there was one example where I sneezed and instead of editing that out, I just said, you know what, I'll leave it and put a laugh track. So it made, in, in that case, it made the editing process even easier. Uh, one thing that happened to me quite a bit was I was going through the PowerPoint and I discovered an error in the, in the PowerPoint itself, like an equation was wrong or, or something is weird. And instead of cutting and editing and redoing it, I would just use as an, as an opportunity to, to include the laugh track, make it a joke, and then it also turns into a learning experience for students because if an equation is wrong, then they will start looking at what was wrong about it and what is the right version of the equation, right? So, so some, some were completely planned uh, and you might tend to think that the content-related jokes are the ones that are mostly planned, right? And I think that is true. Um, I burn things in PowerPoint a lot and put a laugh track. So I was teaching about forest disturbances and the forest needs to be burned. And that is a, that is a natural process. However, bad reputation forest fires have. Many forests have that and need fire to regenerate. So I just put special effects. And then I started putting laugh tracks when I, when I used the, that technique. And so others, like uh, there was one that I planned, I even put my phone so that the phone would ap appear to be ringing and I get the call and I simulate that they're calling me when I'm at work and uh, please don't call me when I'm at work. And my wife supposedly says, but you're home and because it was online. So that was completely planned and people wonder, was, was that a real call or was that uh, planned? And that was one of the jokes that was the hardest to put the laugh tracks on because it was like, hello, and then a bit of chit chatter, people laughing in the background, and then it starts going up. So I, I had to do a lot of editing the laugh track itself for that to appear correctly. <laughs> so, and I, I would think that keeping a lot of space for spontaneous jokes is good. Uh, because they're kind of more sincere. The other ones, sometimes you have to act on them, like you have to pretend like you have to be some sort of a comedian and uh another thing that i have to say i'm by no means a professional comedian so when when people watch the video they might say well it's not that good well whatever but um but uh, i think the message is also you don't need to be a comedian to do this <laughs> everyone. I hope you're enjoying the show. Interested in learning more? Andreas's paper, his lectures were like watching a show on Netflix, a success story of laugh tracks and pre-recorded undergraduate lessons, published in Natural Sciences Education, is always freely available. It is also part of our larger special section in Natural Sciences Education, entitled COVID-19 Forced Rapid Changes in Education, but which changes should we keep? You can find a link to both of these in our show notes. 
Thanks again also to our sponsor, Meter Group. Meter specializes in robust soil moisture sensing, innovative weather monitoring, cloud data logging, advanced data visualization software, and more. Their well-published scientific instrumentation is used worldwide in universities, research and testing labs, government agencies, agriculture, and industrial applications. Listen to their new podcast, We Measure the World, to hear how innovative researchers leverage environmental data to make our world a better and more sustainable place at metergroup.com slash Earth. Thank you for being our sponsor. Let's get back to the show. So then, I know this was not a, like an official experimental design pre-planned thing, but you did have the opportunity to kind of go back in through some of the surveys and the performance results in in its own way. So I would be interested to learn about any statistical analysis that was done on that, as well as just your experience as a person going through this in a very different time on the planet Earth that happened (laughs) and your relationship with your students and TAs and just kind of more that interpersonal aspect, which is not easy to put into math sometimes. (laughs) Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, In terms of the quantifying this at this stage, it was really difficult. And this was brought by one of the peer reviewers. Like, why don't you just look at the student evaluations for all these courses and see how many times students mention humor? So that was a really good exercise. And it is um, probably underestimating the effect of humor in, in teaching or at least how well received this was because student evaluations of a sample of students even complete them uh, a subset of that even right open-ended comments and there's no there's no scale there to say was the teacher funny or not that doesn't exist so they have to represent that in the in the open-ended comments so I did uh, look for keywords in those comments like laugh laughter fun funny humorous humor uh, hilarious that kind of thing and I found that uh, around a quarter of the comments explicitly uh, mentioned those words so uh, overall it it was really clear that this was really well received like there's no doubt about it now the interesting thing is uh, in my literature review about this there was um, uh, a study in which they actually surveyed what students perceived about humor should it be included or not it was overwhel- overwhelmingly positive, like uh, most people said, yeah, I include humor, there's no harm. Uh, but there's a, there was a 3% of students that said, no, just don't include humor, it, I don't like it, and so on. So I got one negative comment about this in the, um, in the student evaluations, which may be uh, reflective of that 3% of people that just simply don't like humor and would rather not have it. Uh, they may find it distracting. I think that's one of the reasons. Like they're really focused on the academic parts, and then there's a joke, and they're they're distracted by it. Uh, but I think again, it's a it's a really small proportion. Um, regarding my my journey, my personal journey about this, um, it was it well, it really saved my motivation on the online environment. I really thought. Uh, like, how am I going to do this? Like, I, I will really find it really difficult because it stripped out a really important part of my teaching style. So it really brought that back and even, even made it easier in some cases to deal with humor because when you do it in a live classroom, you it can be awkward sometimes. Like the joke wasn't really that good. Nobody laughed. There's an awkward silence. In the in the pre-recorded lectures, you add a laugh track and it's funny on its own. Like the laugh track makes it funny. So it was easier that way because I could, uh, and going back to what you asked before, like the spontaneous versus planned jokes, uh, it happened to me sometimes that I didn't intend for something to be a joke, but it it sounded like a little bit. And I said, you know what? Laugh track, put, put a really quick laugh there. Um, one important thing is how many you you do not want your undergraduate lectures to become a, a sitcom, 
so I think I haven't counted, uh, but I think the jokes come every 10 minutes or something. So it's it's not something that you need to put in every single slide or anything, right? So, so it really made my journey enjoyable. I really enjoyed editing those videos and I was really excited. I never told my students that this would come up. So it was funny to see their first reaction and I wasn't in contact with them because this was online, which tackles the other part of your question, which was how did these help you connect? Uh, interestingly, because the delivery was fully online, it it didn't really produce a lot of connections, at least at, at, least at the beginning when the courses were fully online. Uh, but I could I could remember seeing students comment like did you see the laugh track or because we had discussion posts we had uh, piazza is one platform that we use for discussions and, and students were did you see the laugh tracks did you see that joke like this this was really a novelty factor because i don't think it is really common for instructors to to do that um so uh again uh, a bit of um mixed emotions with the connection with students because of the fully online environment like this was these were jokes that were sent down sent out and i couldn't really see their reaction right there other than the comments that i got at the end um so another important part of these as a personal journey is i think this is becoming um a really important part of my teaching philosophy so I'm, I'm pre-tenured, so I'll go for tenure in a couple of years or something, and I'll need to strengthen my teaching philosophy and simplify it. I have one draft written from years ago, but I think this could be the centerpiece of that, uh, together with uh, motivation. So I'm really interested in how to motivate students to engage more and participate more and perform better. So uh, including motivation and the use of humor as a, a central part of how you motivate students to watch your lectures and to come to class will be uh, quite important. I can already predict it. So this article was out and I got your invitation to the podcast. I'm, I'm having another guest talk um, in, in Ecuador as well. So a friend of mine read it and said, oh, I have a, she's in education. So I have an academy in, in a university. And so I'm, I'm talking about this again. So it, it'll start to become a, a really distinct, distinctive part of what I do and my teaching persona. I think. Sure. I have two extra questions uh, a, as a result of that. So my first one is just to ask now that we are, uh, I, well, I guess I don't know, but I would assume you're not in a fully online environment anymore. No. Uh, so how are you, are you meshing some of these elements? Do you still make use of those online lectures or jokes or assets? Like, what does that look like for you now? It's a really good question. It was, it was kind of tough because I, uh, became a bit rusty in terms of the humor in the classroom setting. I was, it made me a bit, um, comfortable with just, uh, having those jokes put in the pre-recorded lecture. So when I came back, it was a, a bit of uh, difficult to reinsert that, like, oh, I had a joke here. I forgot to mention that joke or something. Um, many of the presentations I have, as I mentioned, have already embedded the content-related jokes in them, so those are really easy to bring up. And there are some jokes that I tell every single term. And if a student is repeating the course for any reason, then the student will... We'll have to hear the joke exactly in the same way, <laughs> uh, but it's it's been interesting. But I my question now is how do I take it to the next level? How do I make the humor even better, higher quality, even more engaging, more content related? So those are the things I'm I'm thinking about right now, so that I can apply it both in the online and in person environment. So right now we're fully in person, so I I think. Most of us needed a detox from screens and uh, be in the classroom and talk to real human beings and, and not uh, screens. And so so that that is what is happening now, but many courses will remain online. Uh, uh, the, I have uh, I am developing now a course that is fully online and it'll always be online because it's for an online certificate. So 
that course is from scratch. So I'm already thinking, how am I going? I'm going to do it again, for sure, incorporate the laugh tracks and everything, but it, it has to be version 2.0, right? And what is that looking like? I am not entirely sure. As I said, probably more clever content related jokes uh, and, uh, and a, a high quality and everything. So more consistency in the laugh track. So for example, I got the laugh track from different sources. So they sound of kind of different, like one has a little bit of echo, another one doesn't. So be more consistent with that. Sure. So, mm -hmm. so then my other question, and this will kind of lead uh, pretty seamlessly into our, our next question after that, which is all about future research, where you think things are, mm -hmm. are going, and also tips for people who want to get involved. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I feel like there are certain stereotypes people have of what scientists or academics look like. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, people might picture just this serious, you know, math science person in a lab coat in you know in a lab taking taking notes for statistics that are going to be super dry or whatever you know there's certain images of people being kind of serious about about science and so i i'm curious as to what you think as to how approaching teaching science in this way can maybe help change some of those stereotypes or open it up for people who might not think that science is for them because they are a, a goofier person or, you know, or, or people who just are like, I can't do, I can't sit and do like a bunch of equations, but I can do it if I, you know, if it's boring versus crazy, like I can handle that, but I can't handle the tech jargon. So I'm just curious as to how you think this is is helping students in that respect of maybe not just like grades, but you know, opening the field a little wider for people who are just learn different. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a very interesting, interesting view. And uh, we are always struggling to make our course more, our courses more universal. So there's an entire line of thought about uh, universal design and how is it that you can make your contents available to uh, the biggest diversity of people. So I think that when we make our contents more enjoyable and with uh, techniques like the ones that I have been mentioning, then I, I really think it'll have a positive effect on the learner. Uh, it'll make it easier for most people. And it will, it will also encourage others to do it. I, I really think that the way that we should go forward is promote a bit more of, um, I don't want to say less academic, but a bit more layman language, simplified language in everything we do. Uh, and academia has been really uh, falling behind on that. In many, in many cases, I've seen conferences that are just, you know, fascinating topics but they are presented in a way that is just so extremely boring like um, why don't you present a slide showing us why your research is important like to normal people to people out there right and so i think by by doing this we're uh, helping on that cause we're helping uh, be a bit more light uh, um, uh, that doesn't mean that you will reduce the quality of your teaching. Uh, on the contrary, I think that uh, if you're going to include a lot of humor, you better make sure that also your content is really deep and the humor will actually make it more digestible to students. So it will actually give you an opportunity to um, deliver more complex concepts and, and help uh, people like the crazy versus boring watershed is just a, a relatively com relatively complex topic that could be simplified by by using those funny terms, right? So um, when I when I posted this uh, article, when I had this article come out and and the video before, I, one of my colleagues was really interested in this because uh, he was having doubts about how universal humor is. And he had bad experiences in the past. He's from the UK, so apparently 
there's a, a big mismatch between the type of humor that we appreciate in North America and the British humor, for example. So, so that was something interesting. And he sent me a really long email with a lot of reflections about, about that. And he actually congratulated me with, when he saw the video because he saw this is really international humor. I think this really will make anyone laugh. Uh, but I've seen it go the completely completely the wrong way in many instances, uh, he said. So, so I think that we will need to reflect on that and 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 encourage more and more people to be more lighthearted, uh, use humor, or and again, humor doesn't mean cracking jokes. I, I think it can be something that is more subtle, that is embedded in the in your writing style that makes it easier to to assimilate the concepts right and so the more people that do that i think the better it will be for for students and for for everyone i like that a lot i think it's nice to be able to just make things easier and you know, friendly for, for people, mm -hmm. especially as they're, you know, first getting started and trying to figure things yep. out. I really, I really, uh, resonate with that kind of, of approach. And obviously it's very near and dear to our heart to be able to connect people to new and different sciences and find the best ways and mediums and formats to, to yep. do that with people. So, and, and there are barriers. Uh, there, there are barriers to that. So, so this is a funny anecdote. So, uh, for these new course that I was mentioning, the one that will be online, it's a new course. So, the syllabus had to be approved by the UBC Senate. So, I sent the syllabus, as many others did. It came back rejected because of a, a language that was too informal. They quoted. I said, okay, and they sent me a copy of the UBC policies for. Uh, syllabi, and I understand that. Uh, it's, I'm not criticizing the policies, but it shows you how there are some barriers to do that. And of course, I said, sure, I'll tone it, tone it down a little bit. It wasn't cracking jokes in the syllabus. It was just having this language that was a bit more... Um, and this course was directed to non-forestry people, so it had to be a bit more simple. It had to be a bit more readable. Uh, but that was one example of of how you can encounter these uh, mini barriers. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And there, I mean, and you're right. There is certainly that line too, like you mentioned of, you know, you can't have the humor come at the cost of, you know, the rigor of the actual content that you're trying to teach, because obviously that would be undercutting the point of taking a class. So certainly there is much more to be figured out in all of those nuances. I know you had some tips for people who were trying to get into this in their own teaching and also just some ideas on future research in this area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I think the first step for people wanting to incorporate humor in their teaching is to reflect on what is your personality how do you perceive yourself as uh, what is your rating of your own sense of humor? Uh, think about the style because some people, again, you don't need to tell a funny joke to be humoristic. You can be subtle. You can have a funny posture. Some people just laugh by looking at them. It's like it, they have a persona that is funny enough so they don't need to do much else uh, and uh, so reflect on what is your teaching style what is your sense of humor and how can those be matched so so the second reflection is how can you modify your sense of humor can you adapt it can you make it different can you improve it can you make it uh, better can you can you change it? That, that is something that I wonder about myself. Is my, because I'm already comfortable with it. Like it is, it is natural for me in the classroom to do goofy things and to tell jokes here and there. But how can I make this better for the students? And again, I can think that uh, the more you think about clever content related jokes, that, that is one way to, to think about it but it is a very personal journey of your own personality. So every, everyone has to find a way of using that and it'll be very, really different among different people. 
Um, and so I, I would think of those two things as the most important. One of the peer reviewers in the article actually said, are there resources that you could list here? And my answer was not really, because I haven't really read them. I can Google some studies or some resources about humor, but it is also such a personal journey that I think uh, people can do their own research and see what are different ways of including those uh, humoristic elements in their teaching. And the third really more concrete piece of advice would be just try the laugh track technique. It's really funny. It's relatively easy. Just put some laugh tracks in your in your video, see the reaction, uh, improve your te technique uh, slowly um, by doing that. And I think that that'll be That'll be interesting. I wonder what would happen, obviously, if every single professor would include laugh tracks. If this becomes a standard technique, probably it loses the novelty factor, right? So, uh, so that will not be the best thing to happen, but, but I, I hope that as many people as possible actually just try it out. It, yeah, I don't think there's a risk of every single professor doing this at sure. all. Sure, sure. Awesome. Well, this has been a wonderful conversation, um, but I don't want to take your entire day. So I have two questions left for you because we already covered one of them, which was how to get started. So then my first question is if people want to learn more about any of the things we've talked about today, keeping in mind what you just said about resources, where can they go? Yeah, so I would uh, well, I would encourage people to read my article because it does summarize a few of the of the studies that have been published. It it does summarize the different types of humor, so it will be really easy for you to apply those concepts. And the other one is, uh, as I, I said before, just uh, find your own journey uh, to improve your or to implement the use of humor. There may be many courses out there. There may be many resources, many blog posts, many websites that I, I tried that. And that is when I said I'm not getting into this because it's just a massive amount of information that you that you have out there. But as long as you tie that to your own philosophy and to your own style and to, and to your own goals as an educator, then that will be completely fine. Like the universe is out there for you. And then my final question for you is, what is one fun fact that people wouldn't know about you if all they had was your research? Well, something that uh, scientific publications don't really open the doors to is talking about the people who inspired you. And I think I would uh, many times love to give credit to the people who, who I feel have been uh, very important in making me a good teacher. And so I have two people in mind. One is my aunt, Adriana, who actually founded a school, uh, they say just for myself and my brothers, but obviously it became a really, a really important school in my city. And she was herself a really good teacher. Uh, but I also had an amazing biology teacher in my last year of high school who really inspired me to become um, an energetic professor and someone who uses humor as well. Her name was Nelly, and she was a really pivotal figure in my education and in my professional career. Nice. Bonus question. Is is that class what got you into forestry and stuff as well, or just teaching in general? Good question. I would say slightly related because uh, the way I got into forestry was because I also like bonsai trees. So when I was a teenager, I was doing bonsai trees and I started learning the scientific names of all these trees, probably also inspired by my biology professor or by my school in general, because she came a bit later in my life. But uh, that interest in trees came through my education in school and and she was a, an influence in, in that so that was uh, an interesting connection that that you just made me remember <laughs> oh good <laughs> bonus fun fact about the bonsai trees that's very cool <laughs> so i'm excited i i got an extra fact um well yeah thank you so much for your time today i really appreciate it thank you for the work you're doing thank you to the people that have inspired you and uh, yeah, best wishes in your future teaching and career and the humor you bring to the class. 
Thank you so much, Abby. It was a really enjoyable time having this conversation. So I, I also wish you the best and hope that we can chat some other time. Hi, everyone, and welcome to our Student Spotlight, where we highlight the work of graduate and undergraduate society student members. Today, we'll be talking to Navdeep. Welcome to the show. Can you start us off by introducing yourself and where you're studying? Um, hello, everyone. I'm Navdeep Kudara, and I'm a first-year PhD student in the Department of Plant Pathology, Physiology, and Weed Science at Virginia Tech in Dr. Sean Askew's lab. Wonderful. And what are you currently researching? My dissertation project focuses on developing best management practices for preventing pollinators' exposure to harmful pesticides through using weed management strategies, and I'm evaluating the effect of herbicide and other crop protection chemicals on pollinator foraging behavior, ultraviolet floral reflection, and floral nectar production in common weeds of managed surface systems. Awesome. And if you could have your dream research project, what would that look like? So I would like to hone my research and communication skills in a manner that will allow me to significantly contribute to the field of crop science to ensure global food security for feeding our ever-growing population. Wonderful. Well, if you'd like to get in touch with Navdeep about his work, we'll have his contact information in our show notes. Thank you so much for being on the show today and best wishes on your future studies and career. Thank you. I appreciate the efforts that uh, Field Lab and Earth Podcast put for inviting the graduate student with this opportunity to share this research. Thank you for listening to Field Lab Earth. More information can be found in the description below. Thank you. Thank you.